7 through 12, uh, but we're going to read all verses 1 through 12, and I'll break it down just so we have context, context, but the idea that I'll be pulling is from verse 9 and 10, and so uh, Isaiah chapter 6, towards the middle of your Bible, Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, so it should be right after Psalms and Proverbs, Isaiah chapter 6. And of course, this is not the beginning of the book of Isaiah. This is actually six or five chapters have already transpired where Isaiah has been preaching to the people of Israel. And yet something drastic changes in verse number or chapter number six, which I hope to look at today. So let's stand together for reading of God's word. Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah chapter six, verses one through twelve. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died. This would be Isaiah writing. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with twain, that would be two, he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, or is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the doors moved at the voice of Him that cried, And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, This hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and I just to hear that voice, whatever it would have sounded like. Some guys have those voices, you know, James Earl Jones, I think is his name, that did Darth Vader, but like just that deep Mufasa also in Lion King, just but guys like that that have that amazingly masculine, loud booming voice and so I can only imagine in my mind it was something like this whom shall I send and who will go for us by the way plural saying us then said I here am I send me you say well that's that's right there's what you should preach well amen but that's good stuff but verses 9 through 12 is where I want to focus and he said go and tell this people Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. You're hearing what I'm saying, you're seeing what I'm doing, but you're not catching it. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants. And the house is without man, and the land be utterly destroyed. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you'd help me with this, just in a timely way to present, or to answer the question, really, why? Why be a witness? Why do the things that we do, Lord? And uh, help us with that today. Encourage our hearts in it. Use the invitation time to help us to change. Maybe put some things in place in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I've titled the message, But Why? And I subtitled it, and I didn't want to subtitle it necessarily because it kind of gives the idea away, but I subtitled it because I said so. (laughs) Because I said so. (laughs) Have you ever done something that just felt completely pointless? My mind, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get into it, but my mind just thinks of the many things, the hoops that have to be jumped through for camp. And it's like, you already made me do a fingerprint, but now you want me to do a trails form, which is basically just another background check after you made me get a background check specifically for the camp. Really? That's kind of pointless. Now, that's the state of Colorado. By the way, if you don't like the paperwork at camp, them either, us either, that's Colorado, that's not us. That's not them, just so you know. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that things. But as a kid, I remember my parents telling me to do things that I really remember thinking this is just pointless. Maybe you've presented some of these arguments when you were a kid. I remember my mom telling us, make your bed. Stupid. What a waste of time. I am going to mess it up again tonight. 
Guaranteed. In fact, when I get home from school, I may sit in the bed or lay in the bed and watch TV or play video games, so there's a good chance it's going to get messed up before I even make it to bed. Why? I won't tell you what my parents' answer to that was. Well, I'll give you a little bit. Number one is because I said so, but there was another answer they always had for stuff like that, which was quality answer, but I can't repeat it from the pulpit. Ask me later. It's just not appropriate. All right. I remember uh, my mom, speaking of mothers and having to do laundry, doing the laundry, and she'd, we each had our own drawer in our, we had a dresser, us three boys had the same room when I was a kid and shared a room, and so we each had a drawer in this dresser. Maybe it's two drawers in the dresser, I don't really remember now, but I remember one of them was socks and underwear, right? My mom would call us, it'd go like this, Lacey, Keith, Casey, Kyler. That was the way she said it, because that was our name, Lacey, Keith, Casey, Kyler. I'm Casey, just first name Stephen, but everybody calls me Casey in my family. Which is really confusing with Lacey. If you hear from across the hall, you hear the ace, and you're like, was that you or me? <laughs> and then the rest of the K's, you never got your name actually called. Anyway, so we'd all show up. We'd get to the laundry room, and she would, she would begin to hand us each a stack of socks and underwear. Socks folded, underwear folded. And I remember her getting very, very upset. Now, you put this in the drawer nicely. You keep these folded. And I remember thinking, It's underwear. It's underwear. No one's ever going to see if my underwear is wrinkly. <laughs> no one's ever going to notice if I've messed up the drawer at all. It's just underwear. And yet, I had to do it. It's pointless though. If you can understand those situations, if you can even kind of get them, to a small degree, you can understand what Isaiah is commissioned to do by God here in our passage. So look back with me. We're going to go really quick. It starts with the vision uh, of Isaiah in verses 1 through 4. Now, many commentators say this. I don't know if this is true because I was not there. If I was there, I'd tell you if it was fact or not. I was not there. Many people believe that the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, while he was a preacher, really he was mainly a servant of King Uzziah, who was his king. He was faithful to Uzziah. He was a prophet for Uzziah more so than the Lord. Now, I can't prove that. I don't know if that's fact. But that's what a lot of people believe because very specifically at the beginning of Isaiah 6, it says the year that the king Uzziah died to imply that really, truly, I couldn't handle being called out by God. I was always, or I was always just kind of commissioned by my king and it was God that got a hold of my heart in chapter 6. So he gets this vision of God and, and praise the Lord for it. It's, it's something that would probably, uh, not probably, I guarantee it would change every one of our lives if we would get a vision of heaven and a vision of God in His glory. But we don't get that. Uh, but at the same time we get a more sure word of prophecy in the word of God. We have many details about God and heaven that, that we can glean from. So anyways, he gets this vision and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because my point is to get to the end, but he gets this vision and he sees, he sees the king, the Lord of lords. Now, I don't know how it would have looked. I don't know if it was God in a, on a throne and Jesus at his right hand and the Holy Spirit at his left hand. And the only reason I imagine there was multiple thrones because they were talking to each other. And because it's said that they said unto, you know, I, and then said, you know, who shall I send? Who shall go for us? And there's like they were talking to each other. And so I don't know. Maybe it was just God. I, maybe it's not even what we would even understand because Isaiah doesn't understand what he's seeing. He's writing down the closest thing that he can think of that makes sense to what he's seeing, but I bet he doesn't really even understand. So he sees the throne, and then around him is these seraphims, angelic-like creatures that all have six wings, and yet they only use two wings to fly, and two wings cover their face, and two wings cover their feet, and so they, they can't look upon the Lord because He's so holy. They can't stand in the presence. God because he's so holy so they just fly around screaming out holy 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 and the voice of this one in verse number four it says that uh, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and so I believe that's God there whenever the Lord's oh, animals I don't know what you do with that I, I don't know you try to train them to be a church they're just just animals as, Sol as Solomon said uh, anyways <laughs> He threw me off. Squirrel, come on, man. You know better. Okay. Right, I get so easily distracted. It's a Jones thing. Just ask Brother Ron Jones. Me and him are kindred spirits with it. Text. So, anyways, we know the voice of the Lord when he spoke. It says that it would shake the posts of the doors and stuff. So, I, I can only imagine the voice of God when he just, you know, 
whatever he said to whoever he said it. We know he talks at some points, and it's just an amazing sight that he sees, and it, it just it's an amazing thing. And so uh, I can't explain it, and so and, and truly Isaiah can't really explain what he saw. But look at his reaction. That's in verses five through seven. We see the reaction of of Isaiah being in the midst uh, or standing before God. He immediately begins to feel unworthy. Look at verse five. It says, "Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." And so he said, man, I don't belong here. And I, I imagine him falling to his face and I imagine him get down and saying, man, I should not be here because it's a good sign that you probably shouldn't look if everybody flying around is not looking. Does that make sense? Like, I believe he got down and stopped looking because if he looked around, saw the Lord, saw all these things flying around, covering their eyes, he probably thought, I can't look either. That or the glory of it just hurt his eyes or his face. So he gets down and says, man, I, I shouldn't be here. I'm just, I'm, if, I, if I could simplify it, I'm just a guy. No, I'm just a guy. I've had bad thoughts. I've said things I shouldn't say. I've looked at things I shouldn't look at. I've said things that I, don't, that I know are wrong. I do not belong here. And so he humbles himself. And, and, and by the way, it would be good for us to remember who we serve. Yes, yes. It, might, it might stop us from doing a few of the, the wrong things that we do if we remember that we're a servant of, of God. So he falls down. He expresses that he's a man of unclean lips. And then one of the seraphims takes a live coal off of the altar. Now, obviously, there's an altar there in heaven. We don't know what that would look like or what that would be like or what exactly is going on. We know that smoke's filling the room, which is even weirder. I don't, you know, this is Isaiah trying to explain what he sees. But then one of these seraphims, and I don't know if the seraphim picked it up with his bare hand. In my mind, it's like with tongs and, you know, and let's just read it here, verse, verse number 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. So he took it with tongs and then he puts it in his hands or does he hold it? But now, like, you read that and see how I'm getting confused here? It says he took it off with tongs, but then it's in his hand. So he like took it off and then dropped it in his hand. I don't know. Anyway, so I don't know if he's coming at him with tongs or with it like in his hands, but I imagine in my mind like a live coal, you know, like a burning red coal. Don't come at me with that. Like I'm running. I'm, I'm already, and then he touches his lips with it, which is already weird and just, and th but this is what he, this is what it says that that did. Verse number seven. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Personal opinion, I don't believe Isaiah was saved before this. So, but he was a preacher. Yeah, but here's exactly where it says his sins were purged. There's, there comes a point where, even in the Old Testament, they had to get saved. They had to, they had to believe and look forward to the coming Messiah, the same way we look back. And so I believe while he may have believed in the Messiah, while he may have served the Messiah or God, he did not get saved until this point. That's personal opinion. You don't have to take that. It says this, uh, thy, thy sins have been uh, taken away, or I'm sorry, and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sins purged. So he's, now he's purged of his sins and what a weird feeling that would be. And so he's still on the ground. I imagine him being on the ground and then feeling completely unworthy and over the sound of the seraphims, so remember this whole time, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, is the Lord Almighty. And like that's just repeated. And then over all of that, he hears a conversation. Verse number eight, he hears a conversation. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord. Now notice it's not capital O-R-D there. So if you go up to verse five, it is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And so I think he got a glimpse of at least he got a glimpse of Jesus, but now it's God the Father talking because it's not the capitalized Lord. And so he hears the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And so I imagine in my mind, I don't know how this worked out. When I get to heaven, I'll send a postcard to the rest of you heathens and let you know. Um, I imagine God sitting there and looking at both Jesus, the Messiah, and then also the Holy Spirit and saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And man, I imagine without even thinking about it, he just like volunteered. Just like, you know, this is, you're in the presence of God. This is, I'll do it, I'll do it. I'd send, here am I, Lord, send me. And one thing I find that is amazing about this is he blurts that out without thinking about it. He had no idea what he was volunteering to do. He had no idea what he's volunteering to do. It's hard enough to get volunteers to do something when they know exactly what they want to do or what they're going to do. We have a sign-up sheet that is to volunteer to bring a side dish to church. And I still don't get it filled every time. Say, why is that? Because sometimes it's hard to get volunteers when you know 
what you're going to be doing. And yet here's Isaiah without even knowing what God wants him to do, just being willing to say, here am I, send me. Oh, by the way, that ought to be your mentality. God, I don't know what you want to do with my life. Here am I, send me. I remember as a teenager, knowing I was going to be a preacher, knowing God was calling me to be a preacher, not knowing where it was going to be, when, how, why, every, all the details. And I just said, just send, I'll, I'll go. I'll preach wherever it is, to whoever it is, I'll go. Anyways, I find that pretty amazing. So he does that. He says, I will go. And here is where we find out what Isaiah has to do and that it is pointless. Look at verses 9, uh, verse 9 and 10 specifically. Read it again. It says, And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. He says, You go let them know that they've heard the truth, because remember, he's been preaching for five years, and Isaiah's not the first prophet to come to Israel, and it's not like they've never heard preaching before. They've had guys like Samuel. They've had guys like David. They've had guys like Nathan. They've had these guys that are preachers proclaim the Word of God. They've had the judges in their low spots proclaim the Word of God. And so he says, You let them know they've heard but they, they're, they're not really comprehending. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. You've been warned of what's coming because the, the point of Isaiah is to tell them of the destruction that's going to come if they don't change their ways, but they don't perceive it. And this says this in verse number 10. Now this verse used to get me all confused, but it makes more sense to me now. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Now, it kind of sounds like there that God doesn't want them to be converted, but what He's really telling them is, you're going you're gonna to preach, and, and here's, if I could kind of summarize and make this simple, you're going to go preach to them, you're going to let them know that they're not hearing what you're saying, they're not seeing what I'm trying to show them, and they're still not going to change. There's going, to be no, there's going to be no visible change. Nobody's going to convert. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to get better. They're going to get heavy. Their eyes are going to be heavy. Their ears are going to, they're going to get sick of hearing you. They're going to get tired of looking at you. They're going to get tired of knowing what I'm telling them. They're going to just want us to, you to go away. It is, it is literally going to be, and this is what God told me, a pointless venture. He says, Isaiah, I want, to, I want you to go to your people, even though they won't listen, and I will show them what I, I have to show them, even though they won't see it. Make them feel dull and bad with your preaching, even though they aren't going to listen. It was very, it was, it was, it was very kind of God to let Isaiah know, it ain't going to work. They're not going to listen. After you hear that, you might think, well, that's just pointless. Go back to my illustration at the beginning there. My mom hands me uh, folded underwear. I'm like, this is dumb. This is pointless. Nobody's going to know. It's my drawer. So I walk over to my drawer. First, my brother had to get into it because he got his underwear first. Get out of the way. Then I just pin it against my body, open it up, and throw it in. Pointless. You're asking me to do something pointless. I'm not going to do it. If I'm Isaiah, right here, God said, you're going to go, you're going to preach, you're going to tell them, they're going to hear, they're going to see, they're not going to listen, they're going to get sick of hearing you, they're going to get dull, and, and, and nothing's going to change. And he doesn't say, why do I go then? That's what I would have said. But why? He does ask another question, which I think is at least fair. Now, Praise God that he was merciful and not smiting Isaiah for even asking. You volunteered, now go. Don't, don't, I'm not giving you details, but he asked this. How long? Look at verse number 11. Then said I, Lord, how long? And then he answers him in verse number 11 and 12. And basically the answer is this. Till they're all gone. Till everyone is dead and wiped out or carried away in captivity. Till it's done. If Isaiah knew that no one would listen to him, why would he still go? Why would he still be a witness? Three reasons today why we need to go, why we should be a witness, why we should make it the main thing of our lives, even if it doesn't seem like it's working. Number one, first reason, pretty obvious one, because God asked him to. No, Isaiah still went because in verse number 9, verse 9 says, Go and tell this people. 
Isaiah volunteered, but let me encourage you, he did not volunteer to go work for 40... This is, this is history, history, we have the Bible. He preached for 40 years without any success. By the way, how can guys like me get discouraged when guys do that? You know, how can guys like us get discouraged when, or pastors like me get discouraged when there's missionaries that don't see their entire time on a field? Or when somebody like Isaiah can preach for 40 years without anybody listening to him? And uh, I, I have a quote in my quote book that it, it says something like, pastors don't have the luxury or time to be discouraged. And I'm with it. I'm like, I agree. I ain't got the time for that. And so he didn't sign up for 40 years of, not, of never seeing any fruit, and yet that's what God told him to do. Be very uh, transparent with you. We already kind of talked about it in the pre-talk. I don't like handing out tracts. I don't like doing it. Why? Do you like doing it? Number one, it's weird. Sticking a random piece of paper into somebody, some stranger's face and saying, here, come to our church. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Leaving it on somebody's door, showing up at somebody's door, knocking on the door and them answering and saying, Hi, I'm out from Peavey Baptist Church, inviting people to church, and I hope to just put a smiling face to, to the church that you've probably seen a ton of if you've gone to Ace. <laughs> Why don't you like doing it? Because number one, it's weird, but here's my, my main reason. It doesn't work. For the most part. I've been here four years, don't know how many tracks I've handed out in that time. You know how many people have come to Peavey Baptist Church that I've given a track to? Ballpark guess? One. 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 One! No, no, no. One! You know how many awkward conversations I've had? You know how many doorsteps I've stood on? You know how many times I've held up the line at Walmart? You know how many times I've held up the line at Safeway? Or at City Market? Or in Divide at the Venture Foods? Or at the gas station? You know how many times I've been awkward and weird for one time? Then why do you do it, Pastor? Because God said so. Because God told me to. Well, I mean, I like results. I like results too. But that's not what we're driven by. Visiting people. I don't like doing it. It's awkward. Showing up randomly at somebody's house with them unprepared. Even if you warn them. Still awkward sometimes. Sometimes visits go fine. Not every visit's bad. But the people that I tend to have to visit, it's not the visits I like to make, if I'll be honest. Does that make sense? Like, it's not you guys I'm going and sitting and having uh, whatever, a glass of water and talking or a glass of tea or whatever. It's usually people that, like, so, haven't seen you in two months. Can I come in? <laughs> it's weird. It's awkward. So why do you do it? Because that's what God asked me to do. VBS, it's expensive. It takes a lot of time and energy. And sometimes we don't have, as of yet, we haven't had the biggest results. So why do we do it? Why waste the money? Well, number one, it's not a waste if any kid hears the gospel that's never heard it, number one. But that idea of if it's kind of, if it's so much work for such little return, I... I, I I got very frustrated with a church that I really love, and I'm not going to say the name of the church. I got very frustrated because when I asked them why uh, about having a bus route, this is what they said. We kind of figured that it's not worth, what, what, what term did they use? The, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze? Is that a term you've heard before? It's like I, I, what they were trying to say was, for as much as it costs us to run our vehicles all over this place, I'm not going to say because then you know where it is, we found it's just not worth it. Wow. I got mad at a church I, I really liked. I was like, that's such a terrible attitude. Yeah. Camp's expensive. Tons of paperwork. It's only getting more expensive and more paperwork every year. Sometimes it doesn't even seem like people want to go. So why do you push it? Because God said so. Because the victories that can be won on that mountain are pretty impressive. And every time we invite that same person for the hundredth time, 
either to church or to a special event at the church, or we witness to that family member that has told us they don't want to talk about it anymore, or we knock on that door, we pass out that track knowing full well this isn't going to work, it's not going to reap any benefits for me. Remember, I'm not doing this for results. I'm doing it for God. And he said to. I was talking to Bill Marshall on 4th of July. We were at the camp, Brother Nathaniel and I. And uh, I, said, I said, yeah, it's a small work. And he, he stopped me and said, there's no small works with God. Amen. There's only faithfulness and obedience. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> now, he said it in a very loving way. He wasn't trying to be mean, but he wanted, I think he was trying to encourage me. Because, you know, somebody like Bill Marshall and his church is fairly large. And they roll up in this huge charter bus. And 73 people come to camp from their church. And, you know, they got all the official gear. And you're like, man, that's... But he wanted to remind me, hey, there's no, there's no small works with God. It's faithfulness and obedience. So why do we do those things? Because um, God said to. Because God said to. It would be much easier to just stop all of this. So there's churches that close their doors because they, they think, what's the point? It's just a handful of us, a couple handfuls of us left. What does it even matter? Well, it matters because God said so. Number two, second reason we should, we should still be a witness, even though it seems pointless, is because of what God has forgiven us for. Look back at verse number seven. Read verse number seven. And he said, and he laid, I'm sorry, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. At that point, Isaiah's sins were purged from him, as in taken away from him, as in blotted out, as in gone, as in salvation. And from that point on, I don't think Isaiah could contain himself but to tell others. Amen. Well, how do you know that? Because he wrote it down. He didn't just take the time to proclaim it. He took the time for everybody to know. Possibly for history. Possibly for the nation after. Possibly for once they come back. He wanted them to know that there was a God that loved him so much that He would forgive him and cleanse him and purge him of his sin. And Isaiah was so moved by that. He thought, I can't just have this. I want everyone else to have this. You know a real reason why most of us won't witness is because we forgot what it felt like the day we got saved. No, no, if we think about it, we can remember, but we don't keep that in our minds. Some of us need a fresh perspective of that time we trusted Jesus Christ. And yes, I say that time, singular, one time, because it's only once that you've got to call on Jesus to be your Savior. And I've talked about it this morning, but man, I'll tell you, I remember sitting in that, that church van and knowing that I needed to get saved, thinking that I already was. And I was weighted down, not just by my sins and the thought that my guilt could send me to hell or my sins could send me to hell, but I had been wrestling with God from like Tuesday night to now it was Friday night. And for you guys, I know you're like, well, that's not that long. But that's a lot of sermons that I went through because I was at youth conference. So it wasn't like, you know, you get a sermon on a Sunday morning or maybe two and then you don't hear another sermon again until Sunday and you wrestle for God for weeks and weeks and weeks. I had heard probably in that time frame, one, two, three, four, five, Five, six, probably six sermons, and then four, four group devotionals with our youth group. I mean, I was fighting with God. And then the moment I, it was like the moment I said the words I said, and I prayed the prayers I prayed, I, I physically felt lighter. Yeah. It's gone. Amen. Yeah. And then I got home, and I was excited to tell my home church, even though it was kind of embarrassing. So why was it embarrassing? Because I was already the preacher boy. It's a little weird when the preacher boy gets up and says, I know I've been preaching to you guys for like, Three years, but I'm not. I wasn't saved. <laughs> no, it's awkward. <laughs> a little weird, but I was excited. I was excited to tell my family. I was excited to tell my friends. I, it gave me, it gave me this, this zeal and this fervor because what I got, I wanted everyone to get. Amen. How I felt in that moment, I thought everybody ought to feel this. What I knew about God and what I had now known personally about God, I wanted everybody to get it. So because of what Jesus Christ did for us in cleansing us for our sins, it's worth it to knock on that door. Whether they don't answer or whether they answer and tell you to get off their porch or slam the door in your face. Which, by the way, in Colorado, I've had less doors slammed in my face in Colorado than anywhere else. People are very welcoming after they put the guns down, I've found. <laughs> very skeptical while you're getting there, but once you tell them, oh, I'm just here for a church, they, they seem to chill out. But it's worth it to knock on that door. It's worth it to hand out that track. It's worth it to preach, even when it seems like nobody's changing. By the way, that's one of the most discouraging things for pastors. 
is to preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, teach Sunday school, and feel like it's not getting anywhere. And if I, I faced, I faced discouragement. I, I won't say I've gotten discouraged. I faced the temptation to be discouraged at different points in my short ministry. Isaiah had forty years of it. Not because I'll see results. Worth it to do all those things, not for results. I'm not knocking doors in hopes that this next Sunday, now don't get me wrong, I want every Sunday this place to be packed, but I'm not knocking doors in hopes that this Sunday we'll bust out of the seams here. Why do it then? Because God asked us to. Last reason why we need to be a witness, even if it seems pointless. Because he's worth it. Because he's worth it. Verses 1-4 through four lay out for us the amazing scene that Isaiah saw. In that moment, Isaiah knew God is worth serving. He is worth my life. He is worth my all. I'm not trying to de- diminish the value of people, but I want us to understand the real value of God. There is nothing in the text that suggests that Isaiah was in awe of the people. No, there's, there's, there's two reasons. <laughs> okay, try not to be too silly here. When I saw Holly, I was in awe of her. There was a desire, probably fleshly, completely honest, but there was a desire for her. That's why I wanted to get closer to her, because of an awe of her. Nowhere in our text does Isaiah say, man, it's these people, I just, they're such good people, I got to tell them the truth. Man, they're such good people, I want to preach to them. No, he was in awe of God. The people weren't worth it. He preached for five chapters, saw no results, and here God says they won't listen ever. But he went because of who he was going for. Now, typically if I were going to use an illustration like this, I would reference uh, a current president, but I'm not going to reference current presidents because, to be honest, that's not the best. So pretend Abraham Lincoln is still the president, or George Washington, or somebody you really you respect. Amen? Good honest Abe. I, I like honest Abe. So pretend he's the president. I know he's not, but pretend. You're like, America would be a lot better. I know, I know. It's not political. This is biblical. Let's just stick with it. So Abraham Lincoln is the president. And uh, you happen to get to see the president, and the president happens to be thirsty, and you have a bottle of water. And he says, says, man, I'm so thirsty. Anybody got water? And you're like, I've got water. Here am I. And so you come forward, and he looks at the water and says, actually, I don't mean to be too picky or anything, but Members Mark Purified Water is not my favorite. I prefer spring water. Would you mind going and grabbing me a spring water? You'd do it. No, I guarantee you'd do it. President of the United States, Abe Lincoln, honest Abe, took off his cap and said, would you go get me spring water? You'd go get it. You come back with the biggest bottle of spring water. <laughs> like, look, I got you a whole case. And then for the rest of your life, you would tell everybody. You'd tell everybody. Hey, back in whatever year. Back in 23. By the way, there's going to be a point where we're just saying 23 or 28 or 38 and no longer. Well, I guess they, they're doing it back in 87, but now we've got to be specific, I guess. Back in 2023, I gave President Abe Lincoln a a spring water that he asked me to get for him personally. You tell everybody. Why? Because when somebody with that stature asks you to do anything, it's worth it. He's the President of the United States. You could ask me for the shirt off my back. You could have it. You need my belt? You need my shoes? What do you need? I'll give it to you because you're worth it. How much more worthy is the God of all the universe? Not, not just the President of the United States, the God and Creator and Sustainer of all the universe. And He's asked us to do something very simple. He's not asked us to produce vast results. Right? Nowhere in His Word does He say, I want to see hundreds at your church on Sunday. Nowhere did He see, say, I want you to, re, to remake yourself every two months. I want another church plan every two months. So what did he ask us to do? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. 
Very simple. Well, pastor, I can't reach the whole world. I know, that's why we have missionaries, so we're going to stick to our, our counties. How's that? By the way, giving financially is how we support the missionaries, so if you want to be part of worldwide missions and be right with God, you've got to give to that. But, so, so what am I supposed to do? Because he's worth it, be a witness. Make it the main thing. Make it the focal point of your life. If you will not, or if you are not willing to go, does that mean that God isn't worth it to you? Now, you may argue that you don't want to go do those different things because either the person you're inviting or the person you're visiting or the people you're teaching, they're just not worth it. But we aren't doing it for them. We're doing it for Him. After a few times of a family member telling you they don't want to hear it anymore, you may think, fine. But keep going at them. Well, they're, they, they're, they're so mean to me now. They just they won't talk to me. Pastor, it's just a waste of time. Don't do it for them. Do it for him. Because he asked you to. Yeah, maybe your spouse or parents or siblings or coworkers will never listen to you. And you will continue to put yourself out there for what seems like nothing. But it's not nothing. It's obedience because he asked you to. Do it for the Lord, not for the results. Everything you do for God, even with no positive results, you have made God proud. Just because you obeyed, God's happy. Just because you've been faithful, that's what makes God happy. Does God get happy when somebody comes to church? Of course. Of course. But God, gets just as, God is just as excited when He sees us invite our neighbor for the tenth time, even though they're kind of at the point where I know they're home, but they're not answering to me anymore. <laughs> Or the coworker who refuses to take lunch at the same time as me because if, they do, if I do, I'm going to tell them about Jesus Christ. He gets just as excited for that. I imagine God was pretty proud of Isaiah who said, I will go even if I never see one positive result. No, you go read the rest of the book of Isaiah and it's amazing. Looking forward to preaching it one day. So, in conclusion, if you aren't being faithful and obeying and being a witness, like we talked about this morning, get to it. Get to it. It's, it's pointless. But is it? If the only reason is because God said, because I said so, that's enough. It's enough. The same way that if my mom says, make your bed. But why? It's pointless. Because I said so. It's enough. And if you are, let me encourage you, keep doing it no matter what. Keep going even with no results till all is desolate. Don't get discouraged. Don't quit. You are doing it. You are not doing it for them. You are doing it for Him. Witness for the right reason. And the right reason is because He asked us to. But pastor, they're not worth it. I'll agree. But God is. But God is. So those two-part sermon, don't miss it. Your witness needs to be the main thing. But it's pointless. That's okay. It's what he asked us to do. Just keep going. Let's pray.